Good morning, y'all. Grand rising to everybody. I hope you're doing well. Good afternoon and good evening around the world, wherever you may be. I hope that you are well as well as your family and loved ones. I want to come on today and talk to you about Besmiani Volcano. This is courtesy of Oppenheimer Ranch Project. And I was, uh, I've recommended their channel before on, on my channel. And done, I think I've done a screen recording of some of their content before. Of course, this is their content. I do not own the copyright. I just wanted to share it because, um, as you know, I share important news and current events on my channel. And I specifically remember referring to you, um, referring you all to volcanoes in Russia. And one of the volcanoes that I specifically named was a volcano named Kamchatka. Now, this volcano is actually named Besmiani, okay, but it's on the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. All right. I remember saying in a podcast episode, I'm pretty sure it's a podcast episode and not a video. If it's not a podcast episode, then it was a screen recording months ago about Kamchatka and the seven or nine other, I think, seven or nine other volcanoes in Russia. So let's go to Google and see. Y'all know I, uh, <laughs> okay, I had to Google that because there was a nice meme on Facebook. Um, the other day, but I don't think it's called the Kamchatka volcano. I think there were the volcanoes of Kamchatka. It's located on the, it's a large group of them located on the Kamchatka Peninsula in eastern Russia, okay? With the Kamchatka River and the surrounding central side valley being flanked by large volcanic belts containing around 160 volcanoes with about 29 of them still active, okay? So I talked about this earlier this year. Uh, let's see... Now, I, of course, I have so many videos, y'all. I have not gone back to look and see which one, but hopefully I'll find it. No problem. Yeah, there was one in 2020. Yeah, it was in April. Okay. Klyuchevskaya eruption. Okay. Started April 21st, 2020. All right. That was the one that I referred to. But I believe it was in that video where I said that I was energetically picking on more eruptions in that region coming. Okay, so here we have Besmiani erupting and it haven't been the largest eruption in months. All right. This being Eastern Russia, that would be their... Pacific seaboard, if you will. And so Japan has picked up on this, of course, from their observatories. And I'm going to play this video. That way y'all can see what Oppenheimer Ranch Project is saying. When I locate the video that I was discussing those Russian volcanoes in, I will put it in the box. Because I think it's very important for me to do that. There was a reading that came out the other day that talked about me being able to see the future. All right. And, and of course, a lot of people have these gifts. But when I'm talking about seismic activity, it usually happens just like I said it's going to happen. Like when I talked about Mount Rainier and that area, I was just looking at a map and I said no. And there were like three or four mountains in the area. Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens. Uh, I think there was another one in Northern Cali, not actually in the state of Oregon or Washington state. And out of those four, I pinged or I was pinged with Mount Rainier. And it was about a couple weeks later, Mount Rainier was announced to have earthquake swarms and there was smoke coming from it. Okay. Someone sent me the article. Besamiani in the Kanchakta Peninsula explodes to 31,000 feet. Here's the report. 
Vesemiani volcano eruption news and activity updates. Emission to 31,000 feet volcanic ash advisory center in Tokyo recorded vigorous eruptions at the volcano yesterday. Characterized by volcanian type explosions, a dense dark ash plume reached 31,000 feet or 9,400 meters and drifted south. Let's take a look. Come over here to Volcano Time Lapse and give them a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And be safe. I just want to say this right quick. Isn't it interesting that... What was the name of that volcano? Let me pronounce it correct. Kluyu, uh, excuse me. Kliyuchevskoy erupted exactly April 21st, 2020. And what is today? Or oh, Well, yesterday was the eruption. Yesterday was the eruption, so or the day before, because, you know, they're ahead on time zone. So the eruption actually took place, I believe, on October 21st, because, see, this video here is dated October 21st, 2020. So that's exactly six months. What are the odds, y'all? What are the odds that those two eruptions would be precisely six months apart to the day? Interesting. We love you. That's a boom to Besamiani Volcano eruption news. Besamiani Volcano erupting explosively yesterday, according to Volcanic Ash Advisory Center, VOC in Tokyo, warning about a volcanic ash bloom that rose 31,000 feet. Aviation color code nil. That means there's not a lot of flights in this region, but we're going to keep a close eye on the Kamchatka as the boom continues. Let's take a look. Okay, that's enough of that because they are just doing a loop on that. Okay, so there you go. Now, if the region becomes more active, of course, you can see um, Kluchevskoy also erupted again on the 12th. Because this is how they write the date in the military and also in Europe. 12 October 2020, it erupted again. Ibeko erupted 26 September 2020. Seveluch, which I mentioned in that video that I'm going to find of mine, erupted 28 September 2020, which was the day that what went direct? Saturn went direct in Capricorn. All right. So these two erupted two days apart, and then Besmiani, 21 October 2020, and Karamiski, 13 October 2020, all right? These are the five or six, or I think I mentioned seven in my video, okay? I'm going to have to come back about this topic, because... I want, I'm thinking about something's passing through as a download and it makes me wonder whether these eruptions have to do with this dark winter, whether there's a tie there with this dark winter uh, code that's been sent out by President Trump himself, okay, because as those of us who are um, you know, have a good memory of our science, 
we know that ash clouds can produce darkness, okay? So, basically, we need to keep an eye, those of us who are interested, rather, need to keep an eye on that eastern, uh, that eastern coast of Russia, all right, that, those clusters of volcanoes, because I also remember saying the legions of the north would rise. I said that in January, and when spirits begin to move about, they create what? natural disasters, earthquakes, volcanoes, and so on and so forth. All right. Storms, if you will. And I specifically talked about the legions of the north and referred to Game of Thrones. And I also talked about the king of Tyre, which is who? Satan, Lucifer. All right. AKA the king in the north. All right. So I was talking about that in regards to people who are attacking others, but... I don't find it coincidental that this area is becoming very active. It's never a coincidence, okay? It's never a coincidence. Now, let me look at a Russian map right quick. Let me turn off my Wi-Fi because I'm a little bit and reload the page. Here we go. Here it is right here. Here's the Kamchatka Peninsula here on the right. This little piece of land here right here there is Klushevskaya Sopka or Sopka Klushevskaya the mountain that I was just referring to okay and the one that erupted the other day two days ago our time uh named Bismiani is also on this peninsula okay Let's see if I can get a better map Here we go. Yes. And there's an airport on that peninsula, of course. Yes. Now, let me see. Is that where the... It, it appears to me that the entire Pacific Rim is becoming very active. And that's what I wanted to say. That's why I'm, you know, that's why I'm looking at these maps. Because on the tip of my tongue as a download, um, the entire Pacific Rim is becoming active. And let me show you what the Pacific Rim is. And you know that uh, those of you um, who have listened to me over a long period of time have heard me refer to the movie Pacific Rim about how they were fighting these kaiju that came through a portal in the middle of the Pacific Ocean down, specifically down in the Marianas Trench, okay? This would be the Pacific Rim, aka the Rim of Fire. Notice here that the Russian Peninsula Kamchatka is right here at this tip here. Right here, you see the, Kir the Kuril or Kuril Trench and then the arrow goes up, and then there's a break there. That is That piece of land right there is the Kamchatka Peninsula where those volcanoes that have been erupting over the last six to eight months are located. So that is within the Ring of Fire area, okay? I believe Alexis K. Tyler, um, shout out to Queen Drip, has also mentioned the Ring of Fire. I have talked about the civilization of Mu also, which the civilization of Mu would have previously been in this region right in the middle here we are right here the um, i used to want to be a geologist and a volcanologist okay so here are the aleutian islands 
I think I've mentioned those in one of my videos too, which if you look, the Aleutian Islands string along from the Kamchatka Peninsula on the left all the way over to, what is that, Alaska, okay, Katmai. And we have heard something recently about Katmai activity. At least I remember hearing something recently about it. I'm going to go to that in a minute. Here is the Marianas Trench here along the Philippine plate, not too far from Japan. I have spoken heavily about the Philippines, Guam, the military activity there, the civilization of Mu. You'll have to go back to the Nipsey Hustle readings to hear me talk about these things because I have mentioned them. And then, so when we talk about <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm I'm so I'm sorry I'm congested, y'all, because a sister be getting up in the morning and until I have my tea and certain other things like lemon water and all that that I drink in the morning, I, I have to clear my congestion, okay? And I really don't have a whole bunch of mucus in my body. It's because uh I believe it's because of the throat surgery I had, but either way it's also because I had something called S V C syndrome six years ago. And it causes fluid to build up in my uh, face and head a little bit. And so when I sit up, it starts to drain and I get a little bit of congestion until, you know, everything kind of, you know, evens out. So here's the Mariana Trench off the coast of Guam. All right. I spoke a lot about Guam in those earlier videos when I was talking about Nipsey, Tulum, the Mu civilization or civilization of Mu. Okay. Let me show you that. Let me move this out of the way. Let's see. And I said that the Ring of Fire or the Pacific Rim would get very active. Okay, very active. So this is where the civilization of Mu would have been. Right here in the middle, right where I said it was. Okay, this is where it would have been. It would have encompassed Hawaii, Panape, Fiji, Marquesi, and the Isola de Pascua. Or the island of Pasca. Okay, this is where Atlantis would. Oh, excuse me. Atlantis would have been here in Atlantic in the Atlantic. All right, and then Mu would have been the opposite on the opposite end, just in the Pacific. Okay, so you see, you have this map here: Lost Lands of Mu and Lemuria. And I believe personally that yes, Australia was a part of this sunken continent, and that there may have been a land bridge. And this is why my attention was being drawn to the Aleutian Islands. Just what, what, what do we talk about in history class in America? The Bering Sea and the Bering Land Bridge, correct? Okay, so that's why they drew my attention, meaning the spirit guys just now grew my, uh, excuse me, drew my attention to the Aleutian Islands, okay? Because that is a part of that remaining Bering Sea Bridge, Land Bridge, that connected people from Russia to North America. All right. You can see clearly that there used to be, before the rise of the sea levels, dry land to walk on. Most archaeologists, geologists, volcanologists, and experts agree that at some point people were able to cross that land. Okay. The same would then be true for the civilization of Mu. Of Mu, okay. It is a term introduced by Augustus Le Plongeon, who used the land of Mu as an alternative name for Atlantis. It was subsequently popularized as an alternative term for the term for the hypothetical land of Lemuria by James Churchward who asserted that Mu was located in the Pacific Ocean before its destruction, okay? This is Mu or Lemuria, all right? Now, there was a video that I did, and I discussed these things. And let's look a little closer here. So this would be the geographical or theorized geographical position of Mu. And let's see what else I can find here. 
I'm sure the Im the uh, information is limited, but it doesn't hurt to look. All right. So as you can see, it would have been a very large continent, you guys. Very large. All right. Bigger than much bigger than Australia. In fact, almost three times the size of Australia. So it wouldn't have been difficult for people to traverse continents fairly easily. Okay. Fairly easily because of where Atlantis was located here. You can see that Cuba, the Dominican Republic, uh, the Caribbean islands, the Bahamas are closer to the panhandle of eastern Florida. But you can see that those islands almost connect to the land of Atlantis as well. So it wouldn't have been hard, in theory, for people to continent hop, okay? And then you have the Azores and the Canary Islands here to the right between Atlantis, the edge of Atlantis, in Africa, and I'm not telling you that because you can see it on the map. I'm telling you that because I know geography. I'm pretty damn good at it. Always have been. Okay. So you have the Canary Islands and or the Azores. Okay. All right. Just like I said. Here's a string of islands here. The Azores on the left, the Canary Islands on the right, connected, would have connected Atlantis all the way down to Africa. All right. Just like I said it did. So this is theoretically how people would have been able to um, continent hop fairly easily back then. Um, but we're going to have to do some more research on this because there is a reason why these volcanoes in Russia are erupting and I know it's tied to some things that I've said before I just haven't put the clues together yet y'all that's all I just haven't put the clues together and so Shivaluch pops to 36,000 feet oh and that was a big one oh yeah I think I used this one before uh, when I talked about Shivalouche. Yeah. And I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but whatever. <laughs> I'm going off of the uh, literal syllabic pronunciation. I don't speak um, Cyrillic or anything, Russian. Yeah, that was April 11th. So Shivalouche uh, was April 11th, but I want to say... There was another one that was exactly on the 21st of April. And that coincided, the Shivaluch eruption coincided with Krakatau, which is where? Krakatau is in the Philippines. All right. So, Krakatau, it says, this tweet, not the only one erupting around April 11, 2020. It was also Kamchatka, like I said. Japan. Sakurajima or Sakurajima, also Kuchinarabujima, and then there was Sumeru, also in Indonesia that erupted. Then there in uh, Mexico was Popocatapetl, and then in Ecuador, the Reventador and the Subacaña, Subancaya. Then in Chile, Chile, excuse me, there was Nevados de Chilan, Chillan. So, in my opinion, volcanoes are like gears of the earth. And when one of them turns and opens, I am not don't mean literally a volcano turning. I'm talking about in a metaphysical sense. When one of them erupts, then you will see another one usually nearby erupt also because of the way tectonic plates work. Okay. Plate tectonics. All right. So not just from a scientific or physical science aspect and mechanical aspect would plates under one volcano erupt volcanoes or, or, or um, cause volcanoes nearby to 
um, be disturbed, if you will, and cause earthquakes due to plate tectonics. It's also a spiritual thing because there are spirits. Most cultures in the world believe in spirits associated with volcanoes. Okay. I personally have spoken of one particular um, spirit that I have come in contact with, um, which was Surtur, who is an Icelandic or Norse uh, god that they featured in Thor Ragnarok. I think it was Thor Ragnarok that they featured that god Surtur, the one that was sitting on his throne in hell and um, had Thor chained up. Yeah, that one. So I'll show you a clip of that in a minute. Um, Vulcan was an ancient Roman, in ancient Roman religion and myth, the god of fire. I'm fucking up my words this morning. The god of fire, including the fire of volcanoes, deserts, metalworking, and forge, in the forge. Volos, who was the Slavic god of earth, waters, and the underworld. Ruomoko in Maori mythology was a god of earthquakes, volcanoes, and seasons, etc. All right. Here we go right here from Oregon State University. As I just spoke about spirits. I've never seen this website before. I talked about spirits becoming active in the legions of the north, right? And where is Russia? Where is Kamchatka in the north? Okay. It says... I just saw, I hate it when Google does that. They show you a snippet of a really, really long passage and then you have to go in like find where that, where that comes from. Okay. Alaska has always been a very active area for volcanoes located right on the ring of fire. There are many historically active volcanoes. There are also 40 active volcanoes that occur in the state, mostly in the Kodiak and Aleutian Islands. Okay. Alaskan volcano legends are primarily Eskimo in origin. Eskimo is a term for the people that are the native inhabitants of the Arctic regions of Alaska, Greenland, Siberia, Nunavut, okay, Quebec, and Northwest Territories. These people are divided into two groups known as the Inuit and the Yupik. The Inuit live in the northern part of Alaska and speak in Yuktitut. The Yupik people live in the eastern, the western part of Alaska and speak Yupik. While these two groups share some similarities in language and region, they have different ways of life and culture. The Legends of Old Willie. For many generations, legends were passed down through oral history or storytelling. This legend was finally put on record by William A. Okiluk, Okiluk or Old Willie. This legend recounted the actual eruption of Skaptar Yoku in Iceland in June of 1783. The summer that never came was when the cloud of ash and sulfur from the volcano was brought by prevailing winds to the northern tip of Alaska. See, this is alluding to that dark winter I just said. Isn't that crazy? The summer that never came. Obviously because the skies were dark. The legend tells of a cloud coming across the sky just as the hunting season was about to begin. This brought cold weather that kept summer and the hunting season from ever coming. Only 10 of the villagers of the region survived. And my next two legends are of four of those survivors. Two of the survivors were a grandmother and granddaughter named Nasaruk and Paniruk. They were alone in a small house with no one to hunt for them. The other villagers were kind, though, and took pity on them, giving them meat and fish. The grandmother saved as much food as she could for the winter by drying the meat and preserving it in skin bags filled with seal oil. 
The grandmother and daughter also picked as many plants and fruits as they could in the summer too and saved them for the long winters. However, as summer was coming, the warm weather was swept away by a cloud from the north. With the cloud, with, excuse me, with the cold cloud, no one came to visit them anymore and the grandmother and daughter survived on what they had saved. They went out into the village to find that everyone else had starved to death and the two survived by eating the skin off a of seal skin boat. Wow. Legends also tell of two other villagers who survived the summer that did not come. The two, a mother and small son, traveled 215 miles through the cold with no food to reach another village that had no food to offer. Oh, excuse me, that did have food to offer. Both of these legends were written down by Old Willie, but were nearly lost in a fire that destroyed his home. His stories that he had spent nearly 20 years recollecting and writing were all lost. All of these legends would have been lost if it hadn't been for author Laurel L. Brand, who convinced Willie to write his stories again, which are now published as the book People of Kuarok, Legends of the Northern Eskimo. The Legend of the Eagle. Another Eskimo legend is that of giant eagles. The giant eagles were said to once live in the volcanoes of Alaska until the last of the giant eagles captured a woman as food for her children. However, the woman was the wife of a celebrated hunter who came to rescue his wife and destroyed the last of the giant eagles. That is why there are no more giant eagles living in the volcanoes of Alaska. Let me tell you something, right? I don't know where that part about spirits went to because Google said it was in that article, but I haven't come across that yet. I'm going to show you something. That legend was depicted in Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. It was also in The Hobbit because The Hobbit speaks of giant eagles. The eagles of Middle Earth. And what does that look like in the background? Right? Alaska, right? Okay, that's what I thought. The giant eagles uh, that picked up Sam. Samwise Gamji <laughs> and Frodo. After Frodo destroyed the ring. Doesn't this Middle Earth look like Alaska? The eagles are coming! <laughs> right that's what i thought yeah i know they get this stuff from somewhere conclusion with so many alaskan volcanoes it is not surprising that volcanoes are an integral part of the eskimo way of life most eskimo history is passed down from generation to generation in stories and songs and it is difficult to find written records however because of people like old willie these stories are occasionally written down and can be shared with the rest of the world now Okay, I didn't even know there was more down here. Okay. Santorini. This is interesting that Santorini is here because I was just thinking about Greece last night. And I wasn't doing any research. It just popped up in my spirit. And, and the reason why Greece popped up in my spirit was because of Thracia. Because someone was talking about the Thracians. Thracia, okay, is a region uh, in the Balkans. But there's there was somebody talking about yesterday about a Thracian race of people from another planet. Now, I've heard of the Thracians before, but maybe I have the name wrong. Let me see if I can find the video. I would have put that in. Where would I put that? No, it wasn't there. Something about some Thracians yesterday, and that's why I was thinking about Greece. I will come across it. I don't, damn, I, I hate when I lose shit like that. 
three um these people look like damn giants I'm gonna have to do some more research on this okay because I saw a video yesterday about some rays from another star system called the Thracians. Or maybe I'm... Is it, could it be this? I don't know. I know how to pronounce shit. It's not that. No, these people are connected. If it is another race from another star system, either way, they're connected to Thracia in Greece, ancient Greece. That's my connection that I'm making to it. I'm going to have to do another video on that. I'm not trying to go off of topic. Let's go back to volcano folklore, okay? Um, we talk about the Minotaur in the occult, okay, and the labyrinth. So this is talking about Athens, the Mycenaean city ruled by King Minos. It is said that Poseidon, the god Poseidon, gave a great bull to King Minos as a gift. The king's wife, Pasiphae, fell in love with the bull and seduced him, and the result was the Minotaur. When King Minos discovered that the, min the Minotaur, he locked him in a great maze. This maze is thought to possibly be the palace of Nosos. Minos had rule over much of the Mediterranean, and when his son, Androgeus, was killed by the Athenians, he forced them to send a tribute of seven men and seven women to Crete as prey for the Minotaur. Theseus, I've talked about Theseus before, son of the Athenian king Aegeus, for which the Aegean Sea is named after, volunteered to go to Crete where he defeated the Minotaur, led the people out of the maze, and freed the Athenians in Crete. It is said that this myth could reflect the fall of the Minoan Empire. Empire. I was about to say that the Minoans. Okay, I'm not going to read all of this. Jason and the Argonauts. <laughs> Myth 2. Talks about Hephaestus, which if you remember, Mickey Rourke played Hephaestus in this movie. Hephaestus, Hephaestos same thing greek mythology all right mickey rourke played this character from this myth all right there he is right there That's why I said these movies that they come out with are very important because he played. No, I'm sorry. He didn't play Hephaestus. He played King Hyperion. Uh, that's why it wouldn't come up. He played Hyperion. That's right, because Hyperion uh, was power hungry. So let me go back. After the Argonauts left Talos, they were enveloped in darkness, which could have been the ash cloud. It was also said that Talos had a son, Lucos, which is what leukopenia is in medical terms. Leuco, leuco, leukocyte, white blood cell. Leukopenia is a shortage or um, a deficiency of white blood cells. Leuco means white, the white ones. Lucos drove away the king of Crete and destroyed parts of the island. Lucas could represent the white ash that covered Crete. Okay, it could. Or it could be that Lucos represents the white race because um, Crete is not far from uh, the Caucasus Mountains where they were said to originate. All right. And they said that the old Greeks were brown and black people. 
they were not white. All right. And they even show you that. Like, you see how much tanner they had on Mickey Rourke? They even show you this shit. They show you how brown their skin was. Uh, I can't spell today. Look at how brown they are. Like I said, the ancient Greeks were not white. And most people have figured this shit out. Okay. They got her playing uh, an ancient Greek woman. And she's Indian in real life. As far as I know, I think she's Indian in real life. Okay. So they got a brown woman. Yeah. Frida Pinto. Or is she Spanish? I can't remember. Either way, she's a brown woman in real life. And they had her playing in the Immortals. Then look at all this brown they got on him. I mean, it's dirt, but at the same time. The only ones that seemed to be kind of fair or olive skinned were the um, the Olympians, the Immortals, you know. And this would be Ares right here. No, is that Ares? It's, yeah, that's Ares because... Yeah, that's Aries right there, because the those uh that represents the ram's head. That uh headpiece he has on, he has a hammer, I think, a hammer and a spear. This is Henry Cavill. Mhm. Mm yeah, so they're showing you that these people were brown in a lot of the scenes of the movies, but they're not going to make them all brown because people would then get offended. Okay. So my thing was that there has to be some kind of portal in Greece. There has to be. Now, I want to get to this part where it talks about spirits. Iceland. So we talk about, I just mentioned Surtur, and I didn't know Iceland was in this article. The volcanoes on the island were relatively quiet in the beginning of the recorded time, but when the fires of Hecla began to burn in 1104, people around the world were terrified. Look, this is Iceland. I was actually learning a bit of Icelandic when I was in Finland. Great, it says, great is the power of the prince of darkness. Now he has flung open that horrible inferno, Eklafeld, out of Islandia, where the souls of the damned in flames of eternal fire never thence to return, except when from time to time Satan drags them from the glowing embers to cool them in the piercing chill of the polar ice. And closing that dreary island lest they become too inured to the fires of hell. Hell. Mm -hmm. End quote. Christians of Europe saw Hecla as a doorway to the underworld and as one of two known entrances to hell or purgatory. When people would see lava bombs and other projectiles fly from the volcano's crater, they believed that the fragments were actually spirits. Hmm. These bombs often hissed as they flew due to the cooler temperature of the air, and these noises were interpreted as the soul screaming out in pain. Because Hecla was associated with the underworld, people abroad also thought that it was a meeting place for witches and magicians and patrons of dark magic. Although many legends center around Hecla being an opening to hell, there are some more lighthearted myths as well. In one story, a magician transformed himself into a whale to swim to Iceland with hopes of putting the entire island under his spell. Luckily for the Icelanders, he was startled and eventually scared away when he found that the land spat fireballs and spirits at him. He decided that these spirits would fiercely protect their beautiful land and he did not stand a chance against them. Still others saw Iceland's jagged lava flows and rugged mountains as an ancient battlefield. It was on this battlefield where immortal gods had once waged war against one another. See, why did I just see? I channeled that movie Immortals just before I read this. Y'all can see during this entire video, I didn't scroll this far down, so I couldn't have seen it. 
So I knew I got on that topic for a reason. Immortals, yes. And immortal gods once, wa once waged war against one another. As they fought, they had shaped the land with blows of fists and swords. The terrain also contributes to stories of ice trolls. Haven't I mentioned ice demons on my channel before? I have. In some places, the rocks have been eroded in such a way that they seem to resemble human forms, although decidedly uglier. These trolls are said to have strange and often evil powers. What other movie featured trolls that I just went over? Lord of the Rings. Okay. A lot of the scenery of Lord of the Rings is like Alaska, okay? And or in Iceland, if you will. Or even Greenland. But Alaska and Iceland would be more along the lines of what they show in those movies. It says, Hecla has not had a very glamorous past. Nearly every myth, myth or and legend about the volcano is in some way connected to evil and the demonic. I'm sure with a name like Hecla, the Hecla gonna get you, right? Hecla and Coke. If you don't know what Hecla and Coke is, I'll show you. I heard they went bankrupt, but either way, heck, H and K's are very expensive firearms. So there was a, there's a saying, a slang saying, the heckler is going to get you. All right. So heckler and heckla are the same word. Heckler, H-E-C-K-L-E-R. All right. And heckla, H-E-K-L-A are the same word. Every nearly every myth and legend about the volcano is in some way connected to evil and the demonic. See, that's why you have to be careful with, with names, choosing names, especially for children and other things, because you can imbue an evil energy if it's the wrong name. All right. It's a calling card, it's a vibration. The syllables, the the words that you use, the syllables and the letters in combination, depending on how they're combined. And even the spelling can determine whether it's good or evil or neutral, in my opinion. So that's why you have to be careful what you name your children. Even if you don't have children, be careful what you name your pets. Because, see, you'll name your pet something. And that pet will be bad as a motherfucker. I'm telling you now. See, we fucked up and named one of our cats back in the day Spunky. And Spunky was a fucking asshole. Oh, he was Spunky, all right. He was Spunky. OK, he had a hell of a lot of spunk to the point where that motherfucker would get an attitude if we left him for too long and he would go and sit on the toilet and shred the goddamn roll of toilet paper. It could be a brand new roll of toilet paper. He would shred that bitch all the way down to the cardboard roll and leave it there like, yeah, now clean that shit up because you shouldn't have left me in the house for as long as you did, bitch. OK, shout out to Nosy Hole Live over there. When I heard what she named her dog, see, I know she done got rid of her dog now, but I heard she had named her dog Sebastian. That's not a good name. See, that's why he act the fuck up. I know she said hell with that. She got rid of the dog, but either way, you y'all named his ass Sebastian. Let me show you what the name Sebastian is associated with. Now, I'm not I'm not mad at people who are named Sebastian. I'm just saying, you know, Sebastian is close to the word bastard. <laughs> no offense to the people named Sebastian, but it's very close to the name bastard. And, you know, when somebody acts like a bastard, they're unsavory. You don't you don't like fucking with people who act like bastards. Right. OK. It is. See, Bastion, Bastion is a part of the name. B-A-S-T-A-T-I-A-N. Let me see. Let me show you something else. Bastion and Bastion. Bastion. Stubborn. Okay. An institution, place, or person strongly defending or upholding particular principles, attitudes, or activities. The la an example is the last Bastion of male privilege. In other words, this name 
does not have a good energy in my opinion no like i said no offense to the people who are okay named sebastian but i wasn't surprised when she said the dog was acting the fuck up okay now it can say it can mean venerable or revealed revered but see a lot of the translations for names are are incorrect so you just have to do your own research but going back to hecla Hecla has become a major tourist attraction on the island of Iceland, despite being uh, largely evil and demonic. Legends are even uh, evil and demonic associated with the island, okay, or with this location. It is surrounded by beautiful green meadows and is sometimes draped with snow. This elegance has put to rest many of the horrifying stories of trolls and witches. Hecla is still volcanically active, although today the eruptions are better understood and people come from around the world to witness from a safe distance the volcano throw up fantastic fire mountains, fire fountains rather, that light up the night sky as lava flows down the volcano's flanks. Okay, in Indonesia that you have Bromo. Legend has it that the great Tengger crater in, in Indonesia, I don't know if that's pronounced Tengger or Tengger crater was dug out with just a half a coconut shell by an ogre smitten with love for a princess when the king saw that the ogre might fulfill the task he had set which was to be completed in a single night he ordered his servants to pound rice this caused the cocks to start crowing thinking the dawn had broken and then the coconut that the ogre flung away became gunung batok and the trench became the sand sea and the ogre actually died of exhaustion that's the myth or legend now japan is steeped in myth and legend Japan is a country steeped in myth and legend. Considering the country is 71% mountainous terrain, it is easy to understand why much of Japan's folklore concerns the mountains on the islands. Japan has 109 volcanoes in differing states of activity. Mount Fuji is also the highest and most venerated mountain in Japan, standing at 3,776 meters tall. Mount Fuji is also perhaps the world's most well-known mountain. From the beginnings of recorded history in Japan, Mount Fuji has been th important to Japanese culture, tradition, myth, and legend. The mountain was considered a sacred place for the people of Japan until the Me Meiji Restoration, which occurred in 1868. Indeed, the importance of the mountain is stated rather elegantly in a passage from Myths and Legends of Japan by F. Hadlin Davis. Quote, Fuji dominates life by its silent beauty. Sorrow is hushed, longing quieted. Peace seems to flow down from that changeless home of peace, the peak of the white lotus, end quote. Now, I've also heard a lot of uh, bad stuff about Mount Fuji, too, meaning spiritual, spiritually. Mount Fuji is the source of many myths, underscoring its importance in Japanese society. It has been the home of multiple deities, including the goddess Sengen, also known as the goddess of Fuji, whose temple was once said to reside on the summit of the mountain. In the days of religious pilgrimages to Mount Fuji, it is said that Sengen would throw from the mountain any pilgrims who were impure of, high, uh, impure of heart. Excuse me. So it's a Shinto shrine. Now, like I said, you got some in Mexico here and different Aztec belief systems. Here we go. White Island and Fire Demons from New Zealand. The volcanoes Naguraho, Tongariro, and White Island are present in a Maori legend. A medicine man named Nagatoro or Gatoro was climbing up Tongariro with a woman named Aruho. He told his followers not to eat while he was gone in order to give him strength on top of the cold mountain. When Gatoro didn't return for some time, his followers thought him to be dead and they broke their fast. Gatoro and Aruho immediately began to feel the cold and Gatoro prayed to his sisters in the faraway land of Hawaki. The sisters called upon fire demons that began swimming underwater toward Gatoro. They first came out of the water at White Island to see where they were, and the land burst into flames that are still burning. Wow. 
The demons continued on underwater until they reached Gatoro and burst through the summit of the mountain, thus creating the volcano Goroho. Gatoro was saved by the warmth, but Oroho had already died. Gatoro then took Oroho's body and threw it into the volcano. The underwater path of the fire demons can still be seen, for everywhere they surfaced is now a thermal area. Wow, that's interesting right there. That's interesting. Everywhere they surfaced was a thermal area. It's now a thermal area. That's interesting. So anyway, y'all, I'm not going to make this any longer. I will put this link in the box. I personally believe there are spirits attached to volcanoes. Um, well, here's Russia, finally. I didn't even know they were including different nations in this. Kamchatka, Russia. Volcano myths and legends. The Kamchatka Peninsula in Far East Russia is one of the most volcanically active locations in the entire world. Part of the Ring of Fire, Kamchatka has the highest density of volcanoes and associated volcanic activity in the world. This place, deemed Russia's Yellowstone, is home to over 130 volcanoes, 29 of which are still active today. The land's beautiful scenery and wildlife, along with the numerous outdoor activities available, draw thousands of visitors each year. It is known for its amazing diversity and abundance of wildlife and nearly pristine frontier land. The peninsula, surrounded by the Pacific Ocean to the east and the Sea of Okhotsk to the west, is a 1,250-kilometer-long portion of the 2,000-kilometer-long Kuril or Kuril Kamchatka Island Arc, which contains nearly 10% of the world's active volcanoes. First discovered in the 17th century by Russian explorer Ivan Kamchayi, no, excuse me, Kamchatki, Kamchatki, yeah, Kamchatki. Kamchatka is currently inhabited by over 400,000 Russians. However, the peninsula has been the home of people for thousands of years. Several distinct groups of people call this fiery land home. The native people of this land are divided among tribes known as the Koryaks, Italians, Chukchis, and the Tunguses. Tunguses. Today, Kamchatka is populated by mostly Russian people with the native people of the region making up a minority that represents 10% of the population the region thrives off of tourism and recreation while its base industry is solely in fishing and fishing industries the root of mythology pertaining to volcanic activity in russia finds itself in the stories and beliefs passed on from generation to generation in the tribes of original inhabitants of the kamchatka peninsula each tribe carried a different lifestyle based in large part on location on a location within the peninsula that they called home the way the native people lived and the specific land features that made up their territory in the peninsula led to different beliefs and concepts of life, death, and creation. Many of the beliefs of these tribes revolve around the frequent volcanic activity surrounding their land, which explains the reason for volcanic phenomena. Explanations of volcanic eruptions and other activities sparked the formation of the beliefs of the people. The Koryaks, who are the largest population of native people, call the northern part of Kamchatka home. It is in the north that large volcanoes shadow beautiful valleys of green pasture and forest. Koryak, which literally translates to reindeer people, describes the means by which these people live. The Koryaks are reindeer herders, harvesting deer to provide all of their necessities. The people use deer resources for everything from clothes to shelter. It is from this lifestyle that their understanding of volcanic activity takes shape. The central figure of Koryak belief is Kutka, the great raven god. Koryak beliefs describe Kutka, the great raven, as the first man, father, and protector of the Koryak. Almost every Koryak myth and story deals with the life, travels, and adventures of Kutka. The Koryak believed that creation began when the great raven swooped over the sea and dropped the feather, thus creating Kamchatka. Once he established land, he created men to inhabit his creation. After some time, Kutka created a woman and placed her within the land for the men to continue creation. She was very beautiful and all the men fell in love with her, desiring her affection deeply. As the men died, they became mountains, turning the originally flat land into mountains. The mountains turned into volcanoes as the hearts of the men within each mountain still burn with fiery, fiery love for the woman. It is the hearts of these original men that created the mountains, 
which shaped the peninsula into what it is today. According to the 2002 census, there were 8,743 Koryaks left in Russia. Okay. The Atelmen are one of the least populous, but one of the most ancient peoples of the north. The earliest known archaeological site of the Atelmen presence on Kamchatka Peninsula is 5,200 5, years old or 5,200 years old. The Atelmen made their home in the southern tip of the peninsula known as the Lopatka Cape. Atelmen translates into living here, becoming the nationality of the tribe upon the settlement of the rugged mountain region of the, of the south. A very primitive people, the Atelmen were nomadic hunter and fishers, living this lifestyle as late as the 18th century. The summer months had the Atelmen taking carved boats into rivers and ocean to fish and hunt whale, while the summer months had them taken to the mountains to hunt animals. The Atelmen provided their necessities through animal resources, forcing them to move from location to location. The Atelmen have a, a pagan belief system where they have many gods to represent their creation, life, and death. The Atelmen believe that all dangerous places such as volcanoes, hot springs, forest, water, etc. are ha inhabited by devils, which they fear and respect more than their gods. The gods only explain their existence. It is the demons that dwell within the volcanoes that govern their lives. Volcanic eruptions are explained by the belief that mountain demons called gomuls or Kamuli lived on fish. Doesn't that sound like Gollum from the Lord of the Rings? Now I know what a real Gollum is. That's from Jewish lore. Okay. But doesn't this Gomul, Gomul is Gollum. It's the same thing. And wasn't he in the mountain eating fish on, in Lord of the Rings? Okay. The demons fly down from the mountain tops at night and into the sea to slay fish and whale to bring back to the mountain tops, cooking and eating the catch. This is explaining why the volcanoes light up at the, at night. <laughs> the Atelmen are very fearful fearful of the mountain demons. They will not climb to the mountain tops, as it is believed that the tops are a wasteland of fish and whale bone. If they get too close to the top, the demons will explode out of the mountain. Hmm. The Atelmen pay the demons respect by sacrificing food and throwing bits of meat onto the mountains in order to bargain for safety. It is believed that the sacrifices will keep the demons or the eruptions from harming the people during the night raids. Today, the Atelmen language is now highly endangered and most speakers are aged over 60 and live in scattered communities. However, there is a movement to revive the language and educational materials are being developed. Hmm. And this continues on, continues on, but hmm. volcanism is a significant role in the lifestyle of the people who inhabit the Kamchatka Peninsula. The mythology behind this region is, is as diverse as the people who live there, providing a good indication as to how the people lived. Today, the mythology surrounding the region is not as prominent as it once was, yet the teachings are still passed on within the tribes who call themselves the native people of Kamchatka. See, I am not going to keep, 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 keep going, going, because you can see how long this is. Uh, I will do a part two about the Cascades. So right after I finish this one, I will pick up on part two about the cascades for those well i'll just leave it there i'll leave it here um for those who are interested you can go and read about the cascades mount shasta okay and the sky spirits and then they have all of these published sources that you can do further research of course the devil's tower that's been picking up um frequently in my in my line of sight i've been hearing about uh people talking about the devil's tower a lot lately and sunset crater in arizona I'm not sure why those two keep coming up, but there's a reason. So uh, if I can get the definitive answer on that, then I will come back. But I want to show you all this scene with Surtur from Iceland. That way. Uh, yeah, so this is Surtur here and I'll play the clip and then I'll end it on that note. Thank you all for Bearing with me. Long video. <laughs> Fools. 
son of Odin. Sasa, son of a bitch, you're still alive. Oh God, this gets I my thought nerves. my father killed you. It's like frozen. A half a million years ago. I cannot die. Not until I fulfill my destiny and lay waste to your home. You know, it's funny you should mention that. Because I've been having these terrible dreams of late. Asgard up in flames, falling to ruins. It's and you, frozen, y'all. I hate this the shit. Every all. time I play something on and YouTube, you they freeze, it freezes Rock. up. The fall of Asgard. The great prophecy. Now, hang on. Hang on. I mean, <laughs> back around shortly. Do I really feel like we were connecting there? Yeah. Okay, so Ragnarok, tell me about that. Walk me through it. My Shit, time has come. Off. When my crown is reunited with the eternal flame, I shall be restored to my full might. I will tower over the mountains and bury my sword deep in Asgard. Hang on. Give it a second. I swear, I'm not even moving. It's just doing this on its own. Uh, I'm really sorry. Okay, so let me get this straight. You're going to put your crown into the eternal flame and then you'll suddenly grow as big as a house? A mountain! The eternal flame that Odin keeps locked away on Asgard. Odin is not on Asgard. And your absence has left the throne defenseless. Okay, so where is it, this crown? This is my crown. The source of my power! Oh, that's a crown. I thought it was a big eyebrow. It's a crown. Anyway... It sounds like all I have to do to stop Ragnarok is rip that thing off your head. <laughs> but Ragnarok has already begun. You cannot stop it. I am Asgard's doom, and so are you. All will suffer. All will burn. Oh, that's intense. You know, to be honest, seeing you grow really big and set fire to a planet would be quite the spectacle. But it looks like I'm gonna have to choose option B, where I bust out of these chains, knock that tiara off your head, and stash it away in Asgard's vault. You cannot stop Ragnarok. Why fight it? Because that's what heroes do. Wait, I'm sorry, I, I didn't time that right. I make great mistakes all the time. Everything seems to work out. So you saw how in my last little commentary, you saw how his whole spirit went into that crown. That's why you got to be careful with relics, relics, statues, other antiques. All right. Because they do hold energy. And that was proven right there in that scene. Like I said, they show you a lot of truth in these movies. They show you a lot of truth. So then they wake Surtur up. You are reborn. And that's Loki. And that's God Loki. Ella, enough! You 
on Asgard. It's yours. Whatever game you're playing, it won't work. You can't defeat me. No, I know. <sighs> but he can. People are safe. It's all that matters. We're fulfilling the prophecy. I hate this prophecy. So do I, but we have no choice. Serta destroys Asgard, he destroys Hela so that our people may live. But we need to let him finish the job, otherwise. No. I'll stop you, moron! Stop! Just for once in your life, don't smash! Big monster! Let's go! <sighs> Fine! damage is not too bad. As long as the foundations are still strong, we can rebuild this place. It will become a haven for all peoples and aliens of the universe. All right. So thank y'all for bearing with this long video. I will talk with you soon. Have a good one.